Welcome to our webinar, When Singing is Silenced, Addressing Anxiety. My name is Ellen Johnston, and I serve as the Director of Music, Liturgy, and the Arts at the Virginia Theological Seminary in the Department of Lifelong Learning. Though we won't be taking any questions today, we invite you to pose your questions by clicking on the Q&A or by typing them into the chat, and we will address them at our follow-up Zoom gathering on Wednesday, July the 1st. You will be sent a link for that gathering following this webinar, along with a list of resources. Today, I'm delighted to introduce our two presenters. David Hoover is a psychotherapist and spiritual director in Richmond, Virginia. Bill Roberts is a priest and a lifelong musician, as well as a spiritual director. You can access more fulsome biographies on our website, www.liturgyandmusic.com. We appreciate their willingness to address this topic. We will open our webinar with prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, you have made us in your image to reflect your goodness, and you have called us to use our gifts to build your kingdom. Help us not only to focus on how to develop our creativity, but also to seek the wisdom to use our skills. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello and welcome to our home. I'm Bill Roberts. And I'm David Hoover. Let's face it, we are living in stressful, difficult times. If you're a singer, and you probably are if you're on this webcast today, then you're suffering these days because you're without something that is life-giving and important to your soul. These are anxiety producing times for all of us and there's just nothing like singing to feed our souls and here we are without that avenue so we are here to address your anxieties to talk about how we can face our fears and some practical tips on what we can do to get through these difficult times for those of us who've been singing for most of our lives, we realize that there is gravitas to singing. It's not a frivolous thing that we do. It's not something that we do lightheartedly, though there can be lightheart singing. It's a part of our identity. It's deeply embedded in us. Recently, someone asked Alice Parker, why do we sing? And Alice's answer was, we sing because we have to, like the birds have to. The question should be, how can we not sing? In fact, there's a wonderful old hymn from the 19th century that says, how can I keep from singing? And I've just learned today from my friend Tim Sharp that that hymn comes not only from the time of reconstruction, something that we're facing in our country again today, but it also came during a cholera epidemic. And so those words are particularly poignant for us today. My mentor and, and colleague, uh, Brene Brown, that wonderful social worker and researcher, says that there are three reasons that she still goes to church. She goes to church to receive communion, the, the body and blood of Christ. She loves hymn singing with other people, and she loves passing the peace, shaking hands or giving a hug to people that she's probably going to want to slug on Tuesdays. <laughs> So uh, all those incarnational things that she loves and that we love are all taken from us right now. So we are in a major time of distress and, and anxiety. Speaking of Brene Brown, there's another quote that I love of hers that addresses what we're talking about today. Brene Brown says, you can't selectively numb your feelings. If you numb your good feelings, you numb your bad feelings, you are also going to numb 
your good feelings. You can't selectively numb your feelings. I think that's a great insight. And what it tells us is that we just need to be honest about how we're feeling these days. And we need to talk to each other about it. We need to share the fact that we are grieving. We are going through a difficult grieving time, being away from our ability to sing like we ordinarily do. And we thought it might be helpful to just review for you those Kubler-Ross stages of grief that we studied in school, because we are grieving. And the first stage is denial. We may be in denial about how long this is going to last. Lots of us back in February and March thought, oh, we're going to be back in the swing by June. So our denial shows up in different ways. Uh, we may be feeling anger. That's the next stage. We're angry at the virus. We're angry that we can't get together. We're angry at the way our world is responding to this so that maybe it's just getting worse and worse. There's so many things to be angry about. Then we may be bargaining. We may have some kind of special prayer or if only God, you will let this happen, then I'll do so and so or some kind of bargaining. And in some way or another, we come to the point of acceptance. And that may be where we face squarely the situation we're in and that this is going to be going on for a long time. And the music making we do, the singing that we do is really a way that this virus is spread. And we accept that. And what does that mean? And there's really a fifth stage of Kubler-Ross now, finding meaning. And I think that's what we're all struggling with to find meaning in the face of these changes, in the face of this epidemic, in the face of all the changes we're facing with our racial re-understandings and facing this virus. It might be interesting to ask, how are we growing during this pandemic? Now, I'm reminded a little bit of my friend that I worked with, a priest in Arizona named Liz, and Liz had a great saying. People are always saying to Liz, oh, I know you're having a hard time during so-and-so, but think of the great growth that's coming to you because of this. And she developed this expression, AFOG, which stands for another frigging opportunity for growth. Well, this pandemic is providing lots of AFOGs. But we have learned a few things. One thing we've learned is how important singing is to us. There's nothing that shows you the importance of something like having it taken away from you. And I'm gonna guess that all of us could write a little essay on how much singing means to us today that perhaps we could not have done six months or a year ago. The absence of singing has dramatized its importance and all of us feel that. It has dramatized just how critically important it is to us. And at the same time, we're cultivating new skills, there's anxiety there. Uh, few of us went to school to become uh, audiovisual technicians and learn about Zoom. It never crossed our minds when we were in conservatory or going to school to get our degrees. Somehow or another, um, we are uh, just, uh, it, it just completely uh, overwhelmed with all the changes and, and the, the Zoom experience. Uh, I know recently um, I held my first Zoom workshop and um, it took me a long time, several weeks to get to the point where I felt like I could do it. I had to face my own emotional fears about it uh, and got help from the people that I needed to get help from. So I think those, those are some of the things that we can all do as we're trying to figure out this new technology. And even though there are some things that are not as satisfying, we might take some of these things that we're learning with us as we move ahead. The other thing that we are becoming sharply aware of is the need for our pastoral work. And I'm not talking to clergy primarily now, I'm talking to mostly ministers of music, choir directors, organist choir masters. And I'm talking about the pastoral aspects of your music, of your work, beyond just music. You know, there was a time when we thought that we left all of that to 
um, the clergy people that we are working with. And now we realize, no, that everybody who works in the church has a pastoral responsibility to the people under their care. There are times when your choir members come to you and share something that's on their heart, and perhaps they wouldn't approach anybody else in the church, perhaps not even the clergy, because you spend so much time together that you naturally have this affinity and this ability to engage with each other. Now, certainly you want to involve your pastor or your priest in any kind of work you're doing like this and make sure that there's no sense of competition. If something gets too complicated for you to handle pastorally, to pass that on with the permission of the person who's talked to you, to pass that on to the clergy or pastor and let them speak about that. But we're becoming much more aware during this time of coronavirus that people under our care really need our attention. They need to be in touch with us. They need to know that they are still tethered to us in some way, uh, even though we're not getting together and singing. And you might be kind of frozen or immobilized because the musical renditions that you're able to do are not up to what you're used to. But those social aspects, the spiritual aspects of getting together might be something that you need to pay attention to. It might be that those Zoom gatherings, uh, the equivalent of Zoom coffee hours for your choir to get together regularly so you continue uh, checking in with each other, making sure that your needs are being met so that you know what's going on and just continuing to stay in touch with this folk, this group of folks who are really family. I know in our lives, every time we uh, are in a parish, it's really the choir that becomes our family. And these kind of spiritual needs are so important. So encourage that with each, with each person that you run into. Let's talk about some of the ways that we can do pastoral work. And this can be very simple. It doesn't require a lot of technical knowledge, but the first thing you can do is to pray with people. It would be nice if somebody came and shared a deep hurt with you that you were able to just offer a simple prayer, use the prayer book. If you can't, just use your simplest language to speak to God. God is ready to hear us without our having the perfect words to address God. You might even think about having a spiritual retreat with your choir. You could pull together uh, a Zoom retreat, which would be a wonderful way to center people. Uh, this would be an opportunity to teach meditation skills, teach prayer skills, and to uh, make sure that the choir's spiritual resources are honed as well as whatever musical resources you can pull together. It might be important to um, talk to uh, a spiritual director. Uh, if your choir um, members um, don't have a particular spiritual director, or if you don't have a spiritual director, it might be a, a chance to, to get one. Uh, a spiritual director is someone who can help you focus on where God is in your life at a particular time. So those are some options that, that could, could happen. Uh, also encouraging your choir members to exercise, to see what their routines are, just to see what kinds of activities they are engaging in so that they can take care of themselves. The other thing that you might want to consider if you haven't done it so far is to develop a meditation life. Meditation used to be considered something that belonged in the, in the uh, Far East and didn't have anything to do with us Christians. And Hopefully we have all learned better than that now. We know that meditation is a deep part of our history going back thousands of years to Judaism. And it's something that can make a huge difference in our lives today. If you don't know how to meditate, it's mostly a matter of learning to be still and calm and breathe deeply. If you'd like to know some specific methods of meditating, there's a book called How to Meditate by Lawrence Lachan, that will be on your list of resources that uh, Ellen gives you. And there's one particular chapter in that book that just gives you a catalog of try this and try this and try this, of different ways that you can get into meditation. Meditation does wonderful things for you, calming your mind and centering your heart, focusing your spirit, and allows you to move through life 
with less fear and more calm and more peace in your heart. There are some apps that you might think about as well. Calm is one. Um, Headspace is another. There are lots of daily readings that are available online. Richard Rohr is one that uh, is quite powerful. Uh, daily readings that are available. And I'm particularly fond of the RAIN process that Tara Brock uses. She is a teacher of meditation and RAIN stands for recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. So if you are recognizing where you are, are you feeling sad? Are you feeling frightened? Are you anxious right now? What is it that you're feeling? Just recognize it and then allow it. We tend to run away from fears and from sadness. So just allow it to be there and then investigate is the I. Be curious. Let it be a, a body investigation, not just an investigation in the head. But what do you notice in yourself as you allow that feeling to be and don't resist it and be with it? And then go to nurture, which is the N, to live with whatever you have investigated, to live with that feeling and just be um, a nurturing self so that you can then move on. Uh, if we wanna leave you with any message today, is to notice what's going on with you. Don't be afraid of it, just notice it and get the help that you need to move on to the next phase. Now let's talk about our musical needs. First of all, what can take the place of our singing together as a choir or a congregation? Well, you know the answer to that, nothing yeah. can. That's one reason that we're in such deep distress about this because there is no substitute for our singing as a corporal body together, either as a congregation or as a choir. Or if you're a choir director, there's no substitute for you're standing in front of that group and urging out of them the best sounds that they can get. So let's talk about some secondary alternatives, some things that don't work quite so well, but will at least get us through. Fortunately, we don't live in the time of the 1918 influenza epidemic or the cholera epidemic that I referred to earlier. We live in a time when there's ample technology to get music to us. And so we can listen to pre-recorded music. There are some choirs that are even able to provide pre-recorded music or to draw from their archives if they have that uh, to play for their congregations and to play for each other. Another thing you've got is YouTube videos. And uh, you know as well as I do that there are thousands, probably millions of things that you can listen to. Uh, for instance, I just today spent about 30 minutes listening to Vocus 8, one of my favorite groups. And I just went from one to the other. You know how YouTube will spin around to something else similar after you finish what you look for. And I went through six or eight different renditions of music by uh, by say I was also last night, I was at a meeting with the board of The 13, which is a relatively new vocal group in, based in Washington, D.C., fabulous music group. And we talked about uh, what kinds of things we are doing during the pandemic, as well as how do we meet those deep-seated musical needs. If you do have the option of doing a Zoom choir, you know, uh, there are many challenges to that, but you have lots of colleagues who know how to do that. Certainly the experience of singing your own part along with some, somebody singing with you or somebody playing a part is not the same kind of music making, but oftentimes the end product is very satisfying and, and very and encouraging for your choir. Those of us who remember Easter Sunday when 800 some Episcopal choir singers all joined in the strife is or I think it was. Uh, oh my gosh, I don't even much like that hymn. And I know that the next time I hear it at a funeral or at Easter, 
I'm going to be thrilled to death because I'm going to remember that was like the first choir I heard in the pandemic. So there are ways of making music so that the choir hears itself, even though the, the music making is, is very, very different. David and I sing in the Richmond Symphony Chorus, which is something we're just thrilled to do. We've never sung in a group before because I've usually been conducting and David's been in the choir. And we have weekly Tuesday night meetings, mostly to check in with each other. But our director is uh, so adorable the way she does this. She will rehearse us in something and we are all muted so that we can't, uh, because there's no way to do synchronous singing right now. Uh, the signals all come in at different times, as you may know, and uh, it simply doesn't work to sing together on Zoom. But she nevertheless pretends that she's rehearsing us and she'll stop it even though she hasn't heard a sound we've made and she'll say, now be careful about that schwa sound on the end of that German word. It's not a schwa, it's an S sound. And we all laugh because we know that she's just doing that because she knows what she would hear if she could hear us. The other thing you might do is just to keep up with technology because if this pandemic goes on much longer and we all hope that it won't, I'm pulling for Dr. Fauci who <laughs> says that we might have something that will work by fall and that sounds like great news to me. But if it does go on for a while, my guess is that knowing audio people and video people, they are going to be experimenting with all kinds of new technologies that might be available to any of us regardless of what our budget is or our, our knowledge of technical things. And I won't be surprised that they don't come up with a way that we can do synchronous singing so that we can all sing together online and hear each other's voices because that's what we miss, isn't it? And something to think about is singing again, again with the permission of the bishop or your, your authority person, singing again in large spaces or outdoor spaces. Could it be that you could have some kind of serial singing of, for 15 minutes in a big open plaza or a big open space uh, inside or preferably outside, it seems like, to gather some way or another. Uh, and, and those are things to explore. Uh, in our uh, complex tonight, we're having a violinist come. This isn't singing, but we're having a violinist from the symphony come and we'll all be social distanced around her uh, as she plays for our neighborhood. Uh, to begin thinking of ways outside in smaller groups, uh, quartets that are live streamed or octets that are live streamed or, or singing in shifts uh, so that we can still figure out how we can sing together in, in smaller groups, but possibly outside or in big, large spaces. You know, one thing that we have found very helpful for us is the church that we go to, uh, St. Paul's in Richmond, has not only a service that's broadcast on Sunday, uh, where a few people are in the church distance from one another, uh, but afterwards we have coffee hour. And as you know, for Episcopalians, coffee hour is another sacrament. Mm -hmm. So we have coffee hour by being divided into small groups. And it's wonderful to get not only just the ability to watch a service, but to do what you would do in a coffee hour. You're divided uh, randomly by the program into small groups of whatever size the leader chooses. And then you can actually get to know people you don't know. You can catch up with people that you haven't seen in a long time because there is that social aspect of choir and of church that we miss almost as much as we miss the deeper content. Uh, there's all kinds of transactions that go on between us and uh, sometimes it can't be accomplished over the phone because there's a visual element to communication isn't there and we need to be able to look right in the person's eye and talk to them. What we found with uh, this virtual coffee hour is that we're being grouped with people that we didn't know and people we probably would not have chosen to spoke to in the coffee hour at church but it's a great blessing to us because we've gotten to know uh, some folks that we didn't know before. Why don't you tell that story about what was said in Coffee Hour about the demonstrations in Richmond? This is a very moving story. Well, 
uh, we were in a group of about seven people and um, the Lee statue is sort of the centerpiece of, of the demonstrations in Richmond. And there was a couple who lived uh, just a few blocks from that. And we asked them about the, the noise and the sirens and what was it like to live so close to kind of the heart of Richmond demonstrations. And the woman said, well, you know, um, it's kind of hard to, I, I hesitate to say this word, but it's like there's something holy going on. And we've been thinking about that a lot when she put that word to this time uh, of, of separation, of change, of re-examining our racial perspectives, uh, that something is, is holy that's going on. And we have really been struck with that as this opening into what is happening next in, as a church and, and in our lives. What it demonstrates to me is uh, that coffee hour can be a time of chit-chatting about this, the weather and where you're going on vacation or where you're not going on vacation because you can't go. But that sometimes some deeper truths come out and that was a huge blessing to both of us to hear this woman, an older woman, uh, to say that that noise near her house was not frightening to a, her as much as it sounded like something holy. It just proves how deeply we need those connections with other people. We are wired for relationship. That is the way we're made. We're, we are wired for relationship. Uh, you know, David and I are both extroverts, and so uh, the urge to reach out to other people is not something we need to work on. I wonder how it is for introverts. I wonder if, I've heard some introverts saying, this just suits me fine. I love being by myself and reading, listening to music and do whatever I want to do. I wonder if introverts need to push ourselves a little bit harder than we extroverts do to make sure you stay connected with people because our connections are what keep us sane and what keep us uh, alive and in expectation of what's coming next. And sometimes somebody can bring something in like that word holy to describe these uh, demonstrations that are going on in Richmond. And I, and I think it's especially important that we as leaders tend to ourselves. It is so important that you dig deep in the resources for your spiritual life, that you have a regular prayer practice, that you dig deep for your own meditation practice, that you engage a spiritual director or a therapist or whatever it is that you need to tend to yourself so that you're available to your flock. And, and the way you do that is to tend to your own needs and to tend to yourself. So you have to continue to recognize that there is an assault on our lives, on our inner lives, as well as our comings and goings. And you have to approach it with that kind of seriousness, don't you? Because it is a serious matter. And it requires some rather serious and important things to help address the needs that aren't being met. Um, we need a calm uh, space inside of us to be able to function naturally. And of course, there is tension, there is anxiety, there's worry about what's coming next. Am I going to get ill? Is somebody in my family going to get ill? A loved one? Uh, is my church ever going to open back up? Is my school ever going to open back up and function uh, as it normally does? And related to that is, please, please have a conversation with your rector or your pastor or whoever your boss is. It is so important for your anxiety, for your mental health, for your peace of mind to know what's going on and to keep your rector involved in what you are doing, keep him or her abreast of the kinds of things that you're trying to do. Uh, and, and it's going to try your relationship. If you have a tense relationship with your boss already, th this is going to show cracks in that relationship. It might be that you have a wonderful relationship with your boss, but whatever it is, it's so important to keep the lines of communications open 
Uh, what about your staff singers? What about the music program? What is it that we're planning to do? Uh, what kinds of creative options, uh, some of which we, we have laid out previously? Uh, what can we do? Uh, what is the bishop now permitting us to do so that we can begin having a conversation together and so that you uh, or your rector are not surprised by a direction that you're particularly going in? Most bosses I know of any kind don't like surprises. So you don't want your priest or your minister to find out, oh, did you hear our church choir is performing at the football stadium? They're just going <laughs> to distance themselves right out there on the, on the uh, court and uh, sing to each other. That's not the kind of thing you want your boss to hear because he or she would probably like to be in on the news and maybe even have some input on it before they find it uh, uh, later. One of my favorite sayings is that the first language of God is silence and all the rest is a bad translation. So I just want to encourage all of us to find silence, to find a calming place. And if meditation is difficult for you, then all the more, <laughs> uh, try it, try it, try it. Uh, it's, it's all the more important that you do it because in that silence uh, will be your strength. David and I have both taught meditation, and uh, one thing that we have found is that the, your resistance to meditation and silence is probably a good gauge of how much you need it. So when I encounter a spiritual directees who say, I just can't sit in silence, well, maybe you can walk in silence, uh, if you can't sit that long, some people just have the physical inability to sit still. It makes them more nervous. So there's walking meditation. And you can tell, tailor meditation to your own particular styles. And silence is so important. Uh, sometimes I feel like uh, God has a difficult time breaking through because we create so much noise in our lives that if God did want to say something particular to us, we couldn't hear the voice of God because of all the distracting noise and activity in our lives. And it's ironic when we have, in some ways, more time, how hard it is to carve out some minutes or, or time for meditation. And we, you will, we mentioned before, you will be getting some resources about how to do that, and, and we can talk about that later in our next session if people want to explore that more, but we, we will give you some books too begin that, uh, and also those other resources that you can explore. We would be remiss in talking about resources if we didn't talk about the Center for Lifelong Learning at VTS, so that is always a resource. There are lots of uh, uh, pieces of information on that website, uh, and I know uh, AGO chapters have information. Uh, there are lots of ways, and we'll explore more of those in, in our next session, but there are lots of resources out there but the, the only way to tap those resources if, is if you are brave enough to step out beyond your comfort zone and begin asking questions that you might think are stupid or other people know this kind of thing, you really have to be able to know where you are to be able to access those resources. I would say that another thing we need to do is pray for each other. You know, prayer really does change things. First of all, it changes me. When I pray for you, there is something different that happens in me, and our relationship is altered for the better when I pray for you. If you are a choir director and organist choir master, my own feeling is that your first responsibility to the people under your charge is to pray for them. Pray for them by name on a regular basis. If you have a regular prayer time every day, uh, put those names down and go through them. If you have too many choir members to do it all in one day, then spread it out over several days. But you will be amazed what will happen. It's happened to me so many times that I prayed for somebody for an extended period of time, and out of the blue, we hadn't been in communication for years, and out of the blue, the phone rings, and there is that person. How do you explain that? I don't know. There are people who'd like to say it's a coincidence, but I had a priest in California years ago who said, I always discover that when I pray, there are a lot more coincidences. So do pray for your choir members, pray for your leaders of your church. 
it will make a difference in things. So we hope that this has been a, a valuable time to think about some possible resources, to take seriously the stress that you are under. These are scary times. Um, I've done a lot of brain research in my psychotherapy practice and our amygdalas are just firing. That's the warning signs in our brains. And we are frightened and our brains need calming. And we hope that by having some tools that you can use with your choir, some, uh, some approaches to pastoral skills, some approaches to tending to yourself so that you are praying deeply, digging deeply into your spiritual well, and, and drawing on the resources that are available to you, that this can help calm the anxieties that, that, you're, that we're all feeling uh, under, under these stressful times. Finally, let me say, we are going to get through this. We are going to make it through this. I absolutely assure you that that's going to happen. We'll lose some people along the way and we don't want that to happen. That's a serious matter that will affect our lives. But as a culture, we are going to get through this time of pandemic and we will be stronger in ways, a fog again, there it is. <laughs> we'll be stronger in ways that we can't even anticipate. And I would urge all of us, when we're in doubts as to what to do, concentrate on those three things that scripture tells us will last forever. You know what they are because you've heard them over and over again at weddings. The three things that will last forever are faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Immerse yourself in the love of God. Allow yourself to feel that love. Love is an antidote for fear. It will make, it will dissolve your fear if you will immerse yourself in love. It's not a coincidence that every time those angels show up in the Bible, they always open up with fear not, because they must have been pretty scary or they had something scary to say or they were in scary times. And Isaiah 43 tells us, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. Think about that. God has called each one of us by name, each person in our choir by name, all of us. And reflect on what that means. You have been called by the great God of the universe by name, and we are going to get through this. Shall we pray? Let's do it. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Faithful God, you are the source of all health, all hope, all mercy. You have promised that you will never leave us or forsake us, even in this time of the COVID pandemic. You are as close as our breath. Hold us in the palm of your hand. Keep us focused on you and your work among us. Make us disciples of faith, hope, and love. In the name of your Son and empowered by your Holy Spirit, who reign with you in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Peace. Peace. Blessings to all of you. Thank you, Bill and David. Uh, you might have noticed, some of you, that there was a red stripe on your screen. My screen went dark, so I couldn't see anything, and I covered my camera. But I, we are so grateful to Bill and David for sharing their love, their um, knowledge, and of all things spiritual and musical with us. We hope you will join us next week, three o'clock. Um, you will be sent a link and we will answer you any questions you might have and we can engage in a little conversation maybe. Thank you for being here and we'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>